in every moment, you choose how you want to live your life and who you want to be. It's your ultimate power and your inescapable responsibility. You are the master of your reality. It doesn't always feel that way, though, right? I mean, too often we believe the awful fictions of our fears. We believe our misguided assumptions and our faulty logic. We surrender to our self-limitations. We misperceive our strengths and our weaknesses, misperceive our success and our value. We perpetuate our insecurities and our vanities, and we fail to listen to each other and to our own hearts. How can we take control, creating the lives we want with awareness and accountability? That's the question we explore in this interview series, Mastering Your Reality. We'll consider the question with remarkable individuals who clearly have a lot to teach us on the subject. Today's guest is one such individual. Dr. Barbara Oakley is a PhD in systems engineering, a professor, and her work focuses on the nexus between neuroscience and social behavior. She's literally written the book on learning to learn. She has a fascinating story. Dr. Oakley, thank you so much for being with me today. Isaac, it's such a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So I want to start, if you're willing, with your, your backstory. Um, your, your, your book about uh, learning uh, how to learn math and science um, was really born of a personal experience of yours. Can you, can you share that with us? Um, yes, it's, it's a little bit of an odd story, I think, just in that I flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science. And um, I, I just knew I could never do math and science. Mm -hmm. And so I enlisted in the army uh, because I thought, well, heck, you know, I can maybe learn another language and get paid to do it. So, so I enlisted just so that I could um, be trained to learn a new language. And I kind of randomly picked Russian. Uh, and I did learn a new language. I learned Russian and I ended up working on Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea and how it uh, <laughs> and I had a lot of, um, I got a lot of really good drinking stories. And, <laughs> uh, but the, the thing is, I, I realized that I'd sort of boxed myself in inadvertently. I hadn't broadened my professional expertise. And, there, you know, face it, there isn't a lot of call for people whose sole professional expertise is just the ability to speak Russian. <laughs> Not, it's a wonderful language. So I, when I got out of the military at age 26, I, I, was, uh, I decided to see if I could retrain my brain and, and learn math and science, which is like totally, it was totally alien to my entire personality. But I could also see that there were benefits if I could do something like that. So, so I'm going I'm to interrupt you for one second because... What I'm curious about is you, you said you knew that you couldn't learn math and science, right? It's one of those uh, self-limiting assumptions. Right. What changed in your mind? How did you make that change to say, you know what, maybe I can? Two things. Um, number one is, um, let's see, when you're in the military, you don't have much say so on what you can do in your career. It's you get sent to where you're sent to, you work for who you're told to work for, and there's not much, um, you don't have much flexibility. And I didn't ever want to be in that situation again. I wanted to be able to call my own shots in my career. And if you are very limited in your career options, it's pretty tough to call your own shots and, and be flexible and like move out of something if you don't like your boss, for example. And uh, so it was sort of a, a negative impetus. It was like, I don't ever want to get caught in that kind of situation again. So that was one spur towards, I mean, you might like to think that it's, uh, oh, I just thought, well, maybe I'll, I can do it and so forth. But there was this big motivator because I'd also seen what I didn't want to do. And so that... That gave one, you know, sort of spur to it. But then I think the other spur was along the lines of, hey, you know, if I could learn a language, isn't math 
kind of like a language. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, and if I'm supposed to be being open to learning new languages and having new experiences, shouldn't I be open to trying to do that? So what surprised me was when I started applying some of the same ideas that I used to learn math and science, uh, I mean, to learn language, you know, that I'd previously used to learn a language to learning math and science, they worked. Yeah. And now I understand it's because I was calling on the same underlying neural approaches, best approaches to learning. And um, you, as a, as a, a math major and a computer science major, I, I love it. It's, a, it's beautiful. I agree with you. Math is, is, is in many ways a language. Tell us a little bit about um, your, your, your bestseller that you wrote on the subject. Well, it was a book called A Mind for Numbers, right. How to Succeed in Math and Science, Even if You Flunked Algebra. <laughs> and part of what I did once, well, one of my students once found out about my sordid past as a math flunky. <laughs> And, and he said, how'd you do it? And I wrote him a little email and said, oh, you know, I did this, this, and this. And then I thought, you know, I like to write books. I should write a book about this. Yeah. So I wrote a book and uh, I wrote the book, put the manuscript together and so forth. And then I went to ratemyprofessors.com, which is how professors are rated uh, commonly. And I picked out the top, uh, it was about 3,000 <coughs> Professors all together. Uh, they were, they're the top two or three hundred um, professors for teachers in in engineering, mathematics, chemistry, physics, all, all the and even English and psychology. And I wrote to them all and said, ah. "Could you put my manuscript and give me any insights?" And shocking percentages of them said yes, and they came back with incredible, just some really great insights. But one of the ones that struck me the most was that the best uh, professors in, particularly in the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math, use uh, metaphor and analogy to convey the difficult ideas. So by using a, a quick little metaphor, uh, you, can, you can convey an idea in math and like onboard somebody more quickly and then you can get right into the math. And what sort of more mundane teachers do is they often say, well, you know, that's dumbing things down to use a metaphor. You should just go right to the math. They don't understand that mathematical equations themselves are simply metaphors. And that neural reuse theory shows us that when you understand something using a metaphor, you're actually activating the same neural circuitry you need to understand the in-depth concept itself. So uh, so I was really taken aback to, um, to and, and I communicated these ideas about using metaphor, using um, diff the different modes with which your brain uh, operates in order to um, help people to understand how do you learn more effectively and also things like if you don't understand something the first time you sit down and try and do it welcome to the world of mere mortals like most of the rest of us that's really how our brain functions and uh, just learning about things like that uh, can be very helpful absolutely absolutely now um, am I right that you teach an open course to 1.6 million people. Yep, that's that is. Uh, we're we're getting close to two million now. That is awesome. <laughs> then the course is called Learning How to Learn, mm -hmm. and so I learned how to learn mm -hmm. in order to put the course together. I learned how to video edit, and I I mean I couldn't even really if you put a camera in my hand <laughs> and, and said push this button, I could take a picture. And uh, so, but we, you know, we set up a little studio in my basement. I, I Googled up, how do you set up a <laughs> studio? <laughs> and in like 10 minutes, you can learn how to, what lights you need and, and how to set things up. It was shocking to me. I was invited to speak at Harvard and I thought, oh my word. Here I am, this little Midwestern engineer. I'm speak at Harvard. I was so nervous, and I walked into the room, 
and it was packed. I mean, filled to to standing room only with with a Harvard, um, MIT, uh, Kennedy School folks, faculty and staff. And I thought, why on earth are there all these people here? And it was because. Our one little course, Learning How to Learn, made for less than $5,000 in my basement, has on the order, it had on the order of the same number of students as all of Harvard's MOOCs put together, made for, for, for millions of dollars with hundreds of people. And uh, so it, it just kind of tells you that the, there are many more possibilities than you might think in what what can happen in, in your life. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, I'm really excited for um, your new book, Mind Shift, which comes out in April, correct? That's, uh, that's exactly right. It'll come out on April 18th. And so we're, what I talk about in that book is kind of how do you make major shifts in your thinking? How, how can you how can you, like, mostly it, it often involves learning something new, grasping something quite different. And as with me, the biggest limitation is often just your own um, thoughts that you can't do something. And yet there's a lot that you can do. And in fact, a lot of times you feel like totally incompetent compared with everybody else into, in whatever you're moving into. But the reality is that your, your past, which is very different in many cases from what you're trying to move into, can actually be an asset in, in many unexpected ways. And so I talk a lot about how that can happen. Brilliant. Well, I'm so excited for the book. Uh, it, is, it sounds like in many ways the, the, the sort of the user's manual on mastering your reality. <laughs> uh, which is a subject that I obviously care uh, deeply about. So well, we're, we're, we're excited for the book. Thank you so much for, for joining me uh, today. I really appreciate it. And I wish you all the best. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to read your book, which was absolutely uh, an eye-opener and very helpful for me. Thank you, Dr. Oden.